Okay, so it's time for a, uh, another hunt story, um, guide story, crazy story. <laughs> and uh, I've teased everybody about this one for a while and I'm in between monsoon showers right now. Um, I'm up in the mountains, in coastal British Columbia, hunting black-tailed deer and it's really sucking bad. Um, the wolves have absolutely annihil annihilated everything for the last three years. And it's getting really frustrating. Um, as an example of the frustration, I think I'm on day 16 of hunting what was the, some of the best deer hunting I've ever experienced in my life. And uh, I've seen two deer, <laughs> and that's it. So, um, you know, weather's got a, a something to do with it as well. It's mild, there's no, there's no snow when normally it should be, but still, um, I've normally I could find a pile of deer by now and film them at least anyway, get them on trail cameras or something. But it's just not happening yet, so. So, I'm gonna take this little break to share this absolute crazy story of mine that was uh, that happened it was over 10 years ago anyway I think yeah somewhere around there 10 years ago or something maybe 11 and uh, we were it was the September 1st to 10th hunt which is for us in this northern side of Alaska highway very remote it's a it's a 10 day elk season only because uh, the Ministry of Environment figures there's not that many elk where we are it's just on the fringe of where they're you know they're starting to repopulate so we got 10 days and uh, I had this guy as a new guy never met him before and from what I understood was he had inherited a pile of money through family and he was going on a big game hunt he was alone and uh, let's just say his name was Doug from southern Georgia okay and uh, seemed like a decent guy um, nothing seemed abnormal at all, you know, got off the plane and he told me what tags he had. He had a moose, elk, and uh, probably had a caribou tag, black bear tag, you know, wolf, the usual stuff. We'd hand out to them without any specialty items like grizzly, goat, or sheep. He had an elk and a moose tag and he did not care which one was, he did have a priority species. He just wanted to do a, a big game hunt and have the best time he could and hopefully get a decent bull or of either species or both. I'm like, all right, let's go. So I previously I'd known where there's a bachelor group of bulls up in this high basin. So I took him up there right away because I wanted to get the moose down as, as quick as I could and concentrate on the elk. And cause it's usually typically, it's like a two, two and a half hour ride from my camp one way just to get to, to one of the better elk hunting spots. So uh, we went up to this one high basin right away first day of his hunt so they flew in slept overnight got up in the morning saddled up and rode up into this range of mountains probably about an hour from camp or so hour and a bit but you're hunting the whole way and uh i tied up the horses in the appropriate spot got him and we went on foot we went up over top of this rise where he looked down into the into the throat of this basin which is right at timber timber line and uh and sure enough, here's these three or four bulls sitting there, and the bigger one that I was hoping to find was laying there, and his velvet had just stripped off, and his pans were bright white, you know, you know, really bright, standing out like a sore thumb. And we did a little bit of a belly crawl because we were, we were, we were a skyline with that blue sky. So any animal's going to see, even though, you know, moose's eyeballs aren't that great, they can see you. So we belly crawled over top of the rise, got down a little lower, so we had bush behind us, got him sat in the prone position. I believe it was about a 250 yard shot all the time in the world. And the bull stands up. I got the bull to stand up. I cow, I cow called a bunch of times. And finally the bull stands up and he's broadside. And I'm videotaping actually. I've got this video somewhere on the, with an old high eight tape video, you know, the old video camera. And uh, he starts teeing off in this moose. Boom! And I whop! And I hear the bullet hit him. And I'm, and I'm watching and I'm like, okay, he's not falling over yet. Okay, shoot him again. Shoot him right behind the shoulder. Take your time. Boom. Whop. Hits him again. I'm like, I guess, hold on a minute. He should fall over. I can't tell where the bullets are hitting. I can just hear that plunk. You know, it's like the watermelon plunk sound. He's hitting them. And then uh, the bull's nuts. He's just standing there. Standing there. I'm like, what the hell's going on? Right? Hit him again. Boom. Whop. Hits him again, then he kind of turns like this and slowly starts walking away. And I'm like, what the hell? And I don't have a rifle with me. I actually have a shortened shotgun, 12 gauge shotgun in the scabbard on my saddle. It's my saddle gun for this particular hunt. I'm not hunting grizzly bears or anything. 
don't need any backup shots or anything. So I just got my shotgun. And then, uh, otherwise I might have teed off in this thing and dropped it as well. But, uh, and I go, how many bullets you got left? And he goes, I'll, now remember this point for the story. Because I said, how many shells do you got left? And he said to me, I got, I got four. And he goes back to looking at the moose. Well, no, I got, I got two, two powder in them. And that's sort of, I'm like, two with powder in them. Didn't think too much of it. Remember that. So the bull's starting to stumble away. And I'm like, holy crap. I go, let him out, shoot him. Take your time and, and shoot him in the shoulder. Boom, nothing. I don't know how many times this guy shot. Maybe four or five times. A little ridiculous. And off the bull goes slugging his way into the spruce trees. I'm like, hmm, oh, he should be dead. Laying in there dead. So uh, I got to get going on with the story. It's a long one if I go into every single detail of the whole hunt, but I'm sure everybody's going to be curious about how the bull went. So uh, we go back to the horses, rode all the way down to that throat, tied up, looked for blood, couple drops, not much. And I uh, start walking up in the timber, and all of a sudden, this great big wounded bull stands up, probably three yards from it, like right, right there, closer to the camera than, than I am to the camera. Stands up right in front. I'm looking up at it. And I have a shotgun with a slug in it, so I just up and thumped him with a 12 gauge slug. And that thing actually went clean through him, right in his shoulder. Poof. You see a little fine blood spray coming out of both sides of him. <laughs> Falls over. So I got the miss. So it was early enough and close enough to camp. We rode back to camp, got the other saddle, got the pack horses. Got the Wrangler and uh, took him up, grabbed the moose, rode it back to camp. And because I wanted to hurry up and get my ass out of main camp and go spike camp with this guy, and then I want to get a big elk. Because I'm pretty excited about that. I only get that one 10 day season for elk, and that's it. And all the rest is, you know, moose, sheep, grizzly, and whatever else. But you kind of want to have a good elk hunt. So, um, off we go, I grabbed one, two, three, I don't know, I had three or four horses, two saddle horses, I had like half a dozen horses, and this guy, I'll try to hurry up. And then uh, we go riding off to this other, these other valleys where there's good, good elk, and uh, made a spike camp. Um, I had built a drift fence earlier down the creek, down the creek throat where it tightens right up. If you're not familiar with what a drift fence is, it's a fence that we put across the valley they had, they're where the horses can run past us and run all the way back to camp because there's more horses back at main camp and you know the herd mentality and they're like, what's going on? We don't want to stay here all night, right? And that can really suck for the wrangling in the morning if you wake up and the horses have gone. <laughs> so um, I had a drift fence down there, real nice little camp, and right away we started hunting, elk hunting. And uh, I had called up a bull that evening and it was a seven by six, decent bull, nothing, nothing ecstatic for what I, I know runs around there. Videotaped it. I think I can find the videotape of this bull, the exact same tape I'm talking about and included in the video here. And then, um, this guy seems totally cool. They're, you know, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing alarming, nothing disturbing, nothing annoying about him. Seems like your average guy. And then uh, the next day we went out again, saw a big grizzly bear up on the slope, I remember that. I think I might have this in a video. If I do, I'll include it. And then uh, we rode all the way up to the height of land to the southern side of Southern Valley where we typically found some big mature elk and straight over the top, straight down, here's a great big hammer bowl. And uh, this guy starts teeing off on it. 200 yard shot. And he's flinging bullets all over the place. And uh, he's missing, <laughs> missing extremely. And uh, that didn't go down too well. So we didn't get that bull ride back to our spike camp, and now he's starting to feel a little more desperate, and he's not overly, because I had him pretty jacked up about the elk hunt, because I like to tell my guys, you know, we're gonna get what you're after, but if you listen to me and pass up on some decent animals, we'll get a big old huge monster, you know, prime or past his prime bull, one than what you wanna put a tag on. Now he's like, you know, I'd take that first bull we saw first off, you know, I only got a few bullets left, man. And I'm like, all right, whatever. So uh, we went up another draw and the, the day four, day five, whatever it was, went up another draw, got this bull screaming at me from up in this thick choked uh, timbered valley. Then out comes this bull, legal bull. And it turns out it was the same bull that I videotaped earlier we passed on. And it was a seven by six, I think it was. And uh, he smashed it, it was like 100 yards away. And I videotaped that kill too, I might have it. So uh, we dumped the elk. Cool, I got him on video saying it's the best time he's ever had. One more get asked for, blah, blah, blah. 
we go over to the elk, take the pictures. And here's a funny, uh, funny moment. When, when I was uh, caping and quartering up the elk, all of a sudden you could hear this weird sound just up behind us. And this is thick. We're in a thick burn, thick slope like this, creek bottom. Our horses are tied up over here. And uh, I can hear this weird sound from the direction of the horses. I'm like, what the hell is that? And it was just this like, it's just a weird sound. And the hunter goes, man, I think that's a truck. Sounds like a truck to use on Alaska Highway. We can hear from Alaska Highway from here. I'm like, yeah, no, you can't hear from Alaska Highway from here. And I'm like, oh shit, that's a grizzly bear. Follow me, because we got elk scent going that way. We're in a thick burn. If a bear busts out with us on this elk, it's gonna be eight feet away, 10 feet away, it's that thick. So uh, I go, follow me. So we jump down to the creek, run straight up the bank, and I'm looking back behind us. And here's our horses tied up on the trees, and my horse is going with his, with his lead rope tied on the trees. He's going around the tree and tightening up, and then untightening, and wrapping around and untightening, and he's dancing around like crazy. And here's this sow and three cubs right there, standing there with the horses looking at him. Sow grizzly bear. I'm like, holy shit. So uh, I guess the sound we heard was the bears growling at the horses as they were coming into the scent of the elk, which was just past the horses. <laughs> That's another thing too. I always strategically tie up the horses downwind of the kill um, when we're processing it. So uh, I, I ripped a couple rounds over the sow's head because she was only a couple hundred yards from us, I guess. I ripped a couple rounds over her head and uh, the bears took off. And then uh, we got our elk out, got back to camp, our spike camp. Uh, stayed that night, got up in the morning. No, yeah, then we got back to camp. Yes, yeah, so we got so we got the elk back to camp. I got it all hung up and uh, caped out. And I, it's the next morning. Yeah, it's the next morning, wake up. We got nothing to do, we're tagged out. It was a great hunt. We got a 52 inch bull. Got a nice seven, seven by six bull elk. And um, how at my campus, George, I got three trees up this big. So I got a tree here, a tree here, and a tree here, like a little triangle in front of me. And I notched out three notches in the, in the trees, and then I made a stick that was notched out that would fit in those notches. Two sticks here, and then I filled it up and, and unfolded a table, so it's actually a table. So I had our, uh, our propane cooking stove on top of that, all the cutlery, and it's just a, it's a working table. It's great. And, uh, this guy's sitting on a log behind me, and he's just rambling, like he's rambling, like he's babbling. And I got my back to him, and uh, you know, he's an alright guy. He wasn't like somebody I could, definitely wasn't somebody I'd be best buddies with, that's for sure. We didn't hit it off, you know, long-term friend-wise, but uh, he's rambling away. He had a six-pack of beer, I think. Cause I, remember, I remember him saying, he goes, hey, I'll die off your beer, but I only got a six-pack. I'm like, I'm good, buddy. And uh, he's changing, he's rapidly changing. His demeanor's changing, his character's changing, his tone, the way he's speaking's changing. And I'm kind of thinking, what the hell's going on, man? It's like, he must be one severe lightweight. <laughs> he's only been drinking a couple of beers and he's starting to lose the plot here. And I'm just cooking up some breakfast for us. So I got my back to him and uh, and I'm not talking back to him. I'm not encouraging him to speak because he just starts talking random shit. And then the stuff that started coming out of his mouth was absolutely alarming and unbelievable. You know, he's going on about sleeping with his buddy's baby sister and her name was Jeannie. And uh, yeah, me and Jeannie are riding around in a Harley buck naked in town. We do that crazy shit all the time. Hell yeah, my wife wouldn't say anything, man. She knows I got the money. She wouldn't leave me after. And he's rambling on nonstop, just this dirty shit's flying out of his mouth nonstop. I'm looking at, I'm cooking away going, what the hell's going on, man? Holy shit. This is exactly what he said. He goes, man, I used to be addicted to cocaine. Hell, I remember being in a hotel one time, getting an eight ball delivered to me every afternoon. I'd be sitting there with my handgun, so paranoid things were gonna come through that door and I was gonna have to shoot my way out, man. I do math now, you know, math that cocaine kept my weight down. I do math now, you know, math's a lot better for you. Hell, best thing my kids ever seen was me and the boys doing crank down the houseboat. It's the best thing my children ever seen is all these drugs and us doing this shit. They'll never do this shit. And he's rambling. That's exactly what he's doing. He's just rambling, 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 running his wife into the ground, going on about hookers, coke, going on about the in-law, 
the father-in-law, how he had shit on him for being tied up with a funeral service. And this guy's a cop, apparently sheriff, going on about him and a funeral service and he won't do anything to him because he's got dirt on him for getting rid of bodies for somebody. And just a bunch of this random shit is coming out of the city's mouth. But the most alarming part and upsetting part was the way he was speaking about his children and the drugs that he did, was doing, um, the way he ran his wife into the ground and how intimidated she was of him and how she would never speak up because it's just it was just the most disgusting display. I didn't speak to him, acknowledge he was speaking once, I had my back to him, hoping to God he's going to shut up. Um, you know, by the time uh, we, I threw some food at him, I was grinding my teeth so bad, I was just like, this thing needs to be put down and put away. You know, this, this, this uh, humanoid, you can't even call him a man, this guy wasn't a man, he was an absolute dirtbag. Um, and uh, I just could not wait to get away from this person and get him out of here. And I felt so, so bad. I, I probably didn't go into enough detail of the filthy shit that he was sharing that was coming out of his mouth clear enough or enough maybe I did maybe I didn't it doesn't really matter but trust me this person was a very very dark dark soul very dark and he knew it and he had no problems with it he was almost talking like he was proud of it and when I look back now I almost think man that poor family they would have been so much better off I could have just put him in a hole up in the middle of nowhere here and and rode out of the mountains and lapped him there but obviously you can't really do that right so um uh, this is where it gets really fun. So we ride back into camp. I think he had a small bottle of whiskey now too that he pulled up. So I kept glancing back over my horse and he's back there behind me. And I'm leading the, the you know, the horse, the antlers and all the meat and shit. And uh, he's just rambling, 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 rambling to himself, talking shit. This is like, it's probably like one in the afternoon now, two in the afternoon. So we get into camp and the other guy's there his hunter was a superb gentleman, 73, 74 year old guy, Jerry Jorkinson, I think, farmer from Michigan or Minnesota. One of the other great guy. I think it was Jerry. Might be getting his name up, mixed up with some other hunters, but he's just a true gentleman. And um, we actually exchanged Christmas cards a few times for a few years after that. Great guy. And, um, a true gentleman, you know, like he's like your grandfather, like the best guy on the planet sitting there in the cabin when we get back. And the other guy in the Wrangler helped me unpack all the horses and we're hanging up the quarters off the meat pole for the bush plane to come and grab. And uh, I didn't have the hide off of the quarters yet because I remember maybe two of them because I remember the gu other guy in the Wrangler were, were standing at the meat pole skinning these quarters off. And all of a sudden I hear this yelling, yelling coming out of the cook shack. And there's a cook in there as well. And I go in there, and this sack of shit is buckled over this gentleman. Buckled over him, being intimidating, like some absolute coward scumbag would in a bar or a pub or something, come up to somebody and leaning over the chair, sneering and yelling at him, going, where's my genie? You stole my picture, my genie. I was right there, you son of a bitch. And that's how he's speaking to this gentleman. And I guess what he was getting at was he had a photograph, a naked photograph of his little trollop with him that she gave to him. And apparently he left it on his, on the window by his bunk in the cabin. And uh, I come in there, always trying to keep the peace. I said, hey man, what are you doing, Doug? I go, settle down. What are you doing? He stole my picture. I know you fucking stole my picture, man. He stole my picture. I want it back. I'm like, nobody stole your picture. And... This is a place where good, good things happen. This is a happy place, so settle down. You know, like, just get out of the cabin here and go look in the other cabin, I'm sure you're gonna find your picture. And the poor gentleman's like, no, no, I, I, I didn't take your picture. I, I didn't, no, I, I didn't take your picture. And he's looking, obviously threatened. And uh, I, wanna, <laughs> I wanna grab this guy and rip his face off about now. And then uh, back then, you know, as well, back then, I was just, just guiding for a living and, and it's not that easy to make on. I remember this guy in the very beginning of the hunt, I had a bunch of wolf teeth from the skull that I found. He goes, hey, man, you give me a good bull and elk, you give me a good elk and a moose, and, and I'll trade some of those wolf teeth for this brand new Rolex. And I'm like, deal, <laughs> right? Wolf teeth for Rolex, moose and elk, that's an easy no-brainer. So 
I'm still thinking, I want to get that Rolex. <laughs> but it wasn't that important. So we get him outside. And then uh, I went to the cabin. I, I went to our cabin. I'm looking, I'm like, your stupid picture's probably in the stupid cabin. And his picture was actually on the floor underneath his bunk. So I grabbed it. I go, here's your stupid duck. Here's your picture. All right? Yeah, all right? Grabs his picture. And then I went into the cook shack to apologize to the gentleman. And I told him, I don't know what this guy, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on and with this guy. But I'm sorry. I apologize. This doesn't happen here. This, does, this has never happened here ever before in, in the history of ever in guiding here. And uh, I look out the, the, this, the cook shack cabin. And he is now standing a foot away from our 19, 18 year old Wrangler and the other guide. And he's going, you want you guys want to go? Let's go, let's go, come on. I'll kick, I'm gonna kick everybody's ass, everybody. Like this, right? I mean, this guy's like, weighs probably a buck 70, 5'11", greasy little frickin' sack of shit. And uh, you know, the Wrangler, 18 year old Wrangler's going, I don't wanna fight you, I don't wanna fight you, I'm just skinning this Elko. You know, he's getting all intimidated. The other guy's kind of staring like, holy shit. And uh, I'm watching this, and I'm just kind of leaning against the wall at the, at the, at our, at the cook shop cabin watching. I'm like, hey, Doug, nobody wants to fight you, man. Settle down. Like, what are you doing? This is a happy place, okay? Like, p settle down. What are you doing? What's wrong with you? And then he goes, oh, yeah. Who wants to go? I'll fight anybody, anyone, you sons of bitches. And then he spins his ball hat around backwards, and then he goes, let's go. And he looks at me, he goes, let's go, MFR. Let's go, Mr. Tough Guy. And then he said, uh, <laughs> he goes, yes, be Southern, Southern Georgia Octagon rules, boy, let's go. Southern Georgia Octagon rules. And I'm looking at him, and I'm envisioning knocking the living crap out of him. I'm like, oh, my God, I want to kill this guy so bad. I just want to beat his ass and put him under a rock, right? And I'm leaning up, and I had some nail clippers. I'm clipping my nails. And I'm like, Doug, nobody's here to fight you, right? Nobody's going to fight you. This is a good place, okay? Let's settle down. Quit acting like an idiot. And then he comes walking over to me, like this, right? He's come walking up, and uh, he and he gets his face in my face, and he goes, "Let's go, boy. Let's go. Let's go. Me and you right now, like this." And I'm like, you know, I've never. Uh, I don't claim to be a tough guy, but. Um, I can definitely handle myself and defend myself if need be. And um, I've never walked away from a sack of shit like this in my life. And uh, I'm looking, I'm just, I'm just looking at my nails and I go, Doug, nobody's here to fight you, all right? Just settle down and walk away. And he goes, and then what the hell did he say to me? He goes, no, let's go, let's go. And then he, he comes up and he's two inches off of my nose. This little greasy sack of shit who just belittled this gentleman ran his wife into the ground, bragged about all the drugs they do in front of his children to me the day earlier, is now two inches off my nose, and he goes, would you do my shit? And I'm like, what? Would you do my bullets? Would you do my bullets, mf -er? Would you? I know you took my shit. You're the only one who knew about my shit. You give me my shit. Can you imagine what's going through my brain as I'm listening to this greasy sack of crap now he's accusing me of stealing, I'm guessing the shit was his drugs. Now he's accusing me of stealing his drugs. And, um, and then he said, you're the only one that knew about my bullets, my shells. And what'd you do with my shit, right? Then the light bulb goes off. Day one, shooting the moose. I got four bullets left. I got four shells left. Only two uh, powder. Remember that? I'm like... Oh, no way. No way, you greasy little maggot. There you go. You smuggled crystal meth over the border in your, in your shells instead of gunpowder, you greasy sack of crap. Get the hell away from me. Get the hell away from me. And he goes, you get the hell away from me. And then he touched me. And then I'm like, oh. I'm like, all right. All right, this is it. I go, okay, fine. All right, let's go. Let's do this. Let's do this. And he's go, that's what I'm talking about. Let's fuck it. Let's. <laughs> he's like, that's what I'm talking about. Let's go. Let's go, big boy. Like this, right? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to kill him. So I go, get over there by the other cabin. Because we got a, there's a woman in the cook shack. And I go, and there's no window at the back of her cabin. So I open up the door. I go, stay in here no matter what. And then uh, I go, get up between the cabins. 
I'll see you right there. I'm going to hand your ass between the two cabins. Get over there, you little dirtbag. And then I looked at the, the Wrangler, and I said, hey, go into our cabin and get every single weapon out of there, every single firearm, every single knife. Get them out of there and go put them underneath the bunk of the, the cook in the cook shack. Do it right now. So, so the poor Wrangler goes and gets all the guns. He's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then Numb Nuts, he's standing there between the two cabins and there's horse shit and mud around and he flips his shoes off and he's in his bare feet and he's rolling up his sleeves puts his hat on backwards and he's squaring up so let's go boy let's go boy and uh Wrangler comes back tells me all the stuff's out of the bunk and I'm like okay and then I looked at this little sack of crap standing there in his bare feet and the horse shit high as a kite squaring up in uh don't get me wrong I would have loved to have knocked this guy's head off. I would have loved it. But you know, I'm at, I'm at one of the most world-renowned outfits ever. International award-winning outfitter numerous times. And I'm about to beat the shit out of a customer. <laughs> you know, like that's, you know, you, you gotta kind of catch yourself. But I went, into, I went into the cabin first and take a look around to make sure there's no weapons in there in case anything, something weird happens, whatever. Just keep everybody safe. And um, I come back, and as I'm going to the cabin, I look around, and a, a lot of hunters bring bear spray with them, and they always leave it because you can't fly with it, so we got bear sprays all over the place. We don't use that shit. And then I started laughing myself because I'm like, oh, bear spray. Oh, we're supposed to use bear spray when something's threatening our lives. And I usually always clown around. You know, I'm usually pretty serious on, on my videos. On, on YouTube here, but we're, it's usually comedy hour. And uh, so I grab the bear spray and I come back outside. And the other guy in the ranks down here and the scumbag standing right there. I said to the boys, I go, fellas, this is a can of bear spray. Now we're supposed to use a can of bear spray when something's threatening our lives. Now watch this. I'm going to show you guys what to do with this. <laughs> and I flick that little piece of plastic off of it and I got it and I faced a little sack of shit. And he's going like this, going, don't be, oh, you all, don't you be spraying me now. Don't be, you be spraying me now. Don't be, don't you be spraying me. Like this, right? And I'm looking at him. And then you just see this worthless sack of crap. So, uh, I just kind of grabbed him and winged him into the wall of the cabin. And I was, I was pretty angry. And I said a few choice words to him. And then, um, I went, I told the boys, I said, he does not get one ounce of respect from us, period. Uh, he doesn't even get a glass of water. He's not allowed in a cabin. He is not allowed anything. And then I went into the cook shack, got the satellite phone, and I phoned back to the main ranch house and told him what happened to come and get this, this pile of crap. And he said he couldn't fly until the next morning. <laughs> like, oh, great. So I went to the cook shack, told the cook specifically, I said, this thing does not get any respect from us, period. Not even a glass of water. You're not to give him one ounce of food. Nothing. And she's like, oh my God, are you serious? And I go, nothing. This guy gets nothing. He's lucky to be alive. And then uh, I apologized to the, gentleman, the other hunter, the gentleman hunter again. And then, uh, and then uh, this guy's just stumbling around. I want some food. Y'all are not going to feed me, huh? You ain't even going to feed me? And I go, I'm going to feed you a knuckle sandwich. That's about all you're going to get in this camp until you get out of here is a knuckle sandwich. That's it. The choice is yours whatever and then uh he's off down by the creek and walking around and shit and uh we had anything like again i had every anything and any everything and anything that could harm someone i had it out of that cabin no no knives no guns and then um hidden under the cook's bunk and then uh that night <laughs> you could hear him on the porch And he's like, you know, not going to let me in there, are you? I'm like, nope, you're a dog. Sleep like a dog. Then what happened? I, can, I didn't sleep a wink, obviously. I'm not going to sleep a wink when you got this psycho, junkie, sack of shit who's threatening everybody in camp. I'm not going to fall asleep. There's no lock on the door of a cabin, right? So get up in the morning, and he's acting all, well, he's pretty messed up. <laughs> it's a long night for him. And then uh, uh, the pilot flew in early, the outfitter. And I, we have a mail pouch that goes out in the mail with everybody, every, you know, it's always on the wall if you need anything, or a note or letters or whatever mail you put in the mail pouch and it always goes out with the pilot. 
So I took the bolt from this guy's rifle and I put it in the mail pouch to give to the pilot, the outfitter. Uh, when I took him aside, we spoke about what went down. And then uh, Numb Nuts is packing his shit up and flying him out of here. And then uh, get this one. Um, the I could see him. He goes into the cabin to say goodbye to the cook or whatever he, he was doing. Went up to the other hunter gentleman and he's, he goes, "Man, did I really do that to you? Did I really do that to you yesterday, man? I'm sorry. I didn't. I I can't believe I did that. I, I apologize." And he's talking like this to this guy, right? And then he comes up to the ring and says, "Man, I really trying to fight you. Was I really trying to do that?" And the ring's like, "Yeah, dude, you're an idiot." Man, I, I'm really sorry about that, man. And then I'm off to the side and he, that sack of crap comes walking by me and he goes like this. I still think you took my shit. And then he walks away and goes to the plane. <laughs> oh my God. Well, there you go. How's that for, a, for an embarrassing, disgusting girl's story? A hunter uh, smuggled crystal meth into Canada over the border in his shells instead of gunpowder and decided he needed to uh, get high as a skunk on crystal meth. You know, at one point he even said, he goes, man, boys ain't gonna believe I was been clean for a week. Man, not one of my boys even dreamed for a second believe that I've been clean for a week, man. This is a record. And he said, you know, that's what he's saying to me, standing behind me in, in spike camp. But anyways, that's one of probably, <laughs> that's probably one of the worst memories I've ever had guiding, pretty certain. I got a few bad ones, but not that many. Oh, then there's that celebrity TV scumbag from the Yukon. That's another story for later. Ugh.